I have the privilege this morning of having all of the moms in my life here all on the same Mother's Day, which is crazy. Uh, I've got my uh, mother-in-law, Candace, here. I've got uh, my father-in-law's wife, uh, Ellie, here. I've got my sister, Amber, here. And I've got my mom, Diane, here. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure that's all the moms in my life. And, uh, and so I want to say happy Mother's Day to you. But happy Mother's Day to all of you moms that are here. Um, this is a special day. Um, We stand with you. Uh, We stand with those who maybe today is a little bit of a challenge of a day. Uh, We just want you to know that we see you, we love you, uh, and uh, and happy Mother's Day. Um, It's been a crazy, uh, busy weekend uh, for our family. My son was married on Friday night, and... uh, and (laughs) And thank God, because he was expensive. So he's now on his own. And uh, I know all of you parents with adult children say, yeah, that's not how that works. Um, but uh, I'm, that's how it works in our family. So most every person uh, that I know has uh, a desire to do something meaningful with their life. Every, every person that I know wants to make some sort of difference in the world, to have a sense of worth or value, to be someone of significance. We were actually uh, born this way. I believe that God has placed this inside of us, that there's something in us that has this innate desire to do something of value or worth, to make some sort of difference in the life that we've been given. Uh, it's why, if you've ever uh, heard the phrase, and I know that most all of you have, uh, the phrase midlife crisis. See, what happens in a midlife crisis is you get to the middle of your life, which is actually where I am. Like they say, a midlife crisis comes, you know, somewhere in the range of, of post 40 years old to, to 49, 50 years old. And and you have this moment of crisis where you're halfway in your life and you look back on the first half of your life and you start to wonder, have I done anything of significance in my life? And so now all of a sudden it becomes this crisis. If you look back on your life and you're like, I don't, I don't think I've done anything in this life. And, and so now you start panicking and you start making these major changes in the midst of your life so that you can have some sense of of significance. Now, I don't really believe in a midlife crisis. I don't think that that is a healthy thing uh, because our purpose and our significance comes from God. And I believe that no matter what age you are, God has placed in us a, a unique desire to be people of significance, and it's never too late, as we're gonna find out today. It's part of what we believe here at LifeHouse as a part of our equipping is really to help each individual person discover their unique calling and purpose for their life. Uh, I believe that uh, most people, especially, or not especially, but including Christians, go through much of their Christian life never fully identifying and discovering their unique calling, their unique purpose and plan that God has placed in them before they were ever even born. And so our hope is for you to discover that, to figure out what is the plan that God has for my life, and then how can you pursue that plan passionately? God has given us a purpose, and that no matter what situation you find yourself in today, I want to remind you that you are love. You are loved, you are seen, and you have a purpose. We've been in the book of Acts since the beginning of time, it seems like, uh, at least since the beginning of the year. And there's been a couple times we've been going, for the most part, chapter by chapter through the book of Acts. And uh, there's been a couple situations where we've jumped around, skipped around a little bit in the book. Um, On Easter Sunday, we skipped to chapter 9, the first part of chapter 9, where uh, I gave a message on Easter that God can save anybody, uh, and that's true. 
that if God can save Saul, who was a persecuting, murdering, uh, religious zealot, he can save me and he can save you. And so we talked about his conversion in the first part of chapter 9. And next week, we're going to come back to the middle of chapter 9 and talk about what happened after his conversion. But today, I want us to skip to the end of chapter 9 because we're going to read about a very significant person in the early church. How many of you have uh, ever had a nickname? Just to raise your hands, like somebody's giving you a nickname, whether it's in high school or grade school or whatever, or you've been called uh, a different name. Ho- hopefully, uh, it was a positive experience and not a negative experience. Uh, when I was in high school, I was uh, playing soccer. I know I don't look much like a soccer player now, but I used to play soccer in high school or football, as they call it in Germany. Am I right, Sarah? Uh, so. Uh, I used to play soccer, and I had a teammate who was mostly a friend of mine, um, but he he had a nickname for me, and the nickname was Cafe Con Leche. Uh, That was my my nickname, and it obviously was a play on my last name and also the color of my skin, and if you talk to my wife, how I dance. And so I was coffee uh, with milk, uh, and that was my nickname. And it stuck. And so everybody used to call me in high school Cafe Con Leche. Well, I also have an experience with this because when I was born, my parents named me David after my father, uh, after his father. I'm not a junior or I'm not a third because I have different middle names than my father and my grandfather. But they named me David. And for some of you, you're shocked by this. You had no idea that my first name was David. And so... They named me David, but then for my whole life, they called me by my middle name, which is Ryan. Why? I don't know. I mean, that's a weird thing, right? However, my mom also goes by her middle name, and so I guess they thought they should punish me with that. And so they named me my first name, David, my middle name, Ryan, and I finally have figured out, now that I'm a parent and I, I'm a husband, I figured out why. And the reason why is really pretty simple. That when my mom would be yelling at my dad and me, she would not get confused as to who she's mad at or who she's yelling at. And so it was easier to just call me by my middle name than, than to say, David, and David, and get in here. And it was just, David, and Ryan, get in here. Now it's Mother's Day, I'm just kidding. My mom never, never yelled at me. <laughs> my dad, on the other hand, maybe. Acts chapter 9, there's a woman who enters the story of the early church. This is the first positive uh, mention of a woman in the book of Acts. There was also the woman, as you remember, who lied and died. Uh, And that was a bad experience. But this woman is now mentioned in in Acts chapter 9, and uh, her name is Tabitha. And yet, she goes by a different name. Not because her mom's yelling at her, but because in the Greek, her name means something different. Her name was Tabitha, but she goes by Dorcas. I know a few Tabithas in my life. I think uh, Tabitha's a very nice name. I know no one by the name of Dorcas. And I'm not making any judgment, but If I were to judge or if I were to encourage Tabitha in her younger years, I would say, just stick with Tabitha. It's probably a better option. However, I do like the name, and so we're going to call her Dorcas today. (laughs) We learn about her in chapter 9 as a part of Luke's account of the ministry of Peter. So Peter now is traveling around city to city. There's uh, Scripture tells us that Uh, Many of the believers were scattered because of the persecution that they were starting to experience. But here's what's interesting is, as we've been learning through the book of Acts, the filling of the Holy Spirit brings power and it brings boldness. And although they were being scattered through the persecution of the church, they were still emboldened to preach the gospel. 
And so what was taking place is there was all of these people who were being scattered into all of these cities, going city to city, and they were preaching the gospel message of Jesus, and people were coming to, uh, were becoming believers of the way. Now, in the account of this situation, it's a really amazing testimony of a miracle that's about to take place. But rather than talk about the miracle today, I wanted to focus a little bit more on the life of Dorcas. I wanted to take a look at someone who's really nothing that she's ever said is mentioned in Scripture, but there's some things that are said about her that I think we can glean some lessons from her life as an inspiration to all of us, men, women, mothers, fathers, uh, but especially the women in the room that that you could glean some things uh, from the life of Dorcas as she modeled what a life of significance actually looks like. We'll pick it up in Acts chapter 9, verse 36. It says, In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In the Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Leda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Leda, they sent two men to get him and urge him to please come at once. So I want us to look at this woman named Dorcas and see if we can find some cues on what it looks like to live a life of significance. And the first thing is this, is that you have to start following Jesus. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, my guess is that there is something that you are experiencing that is lacking in your life. See, we are created to have relationship with our God. We were built this way. And if we've never surrendered our life to God, then, then there's something missing, some element of our life that's, that's lacking significance or something that's lacking the purpose that God has placed in our life. We were so designed to have relationship with God that without complete surrender, we can't fully know the purpose and the plan that he has for us. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And so clearly there was a group of people that ended up in Joppa, and they were boldly preaching the gospel message of Jesus. And then this woman named Dorcas, as the church is growing, at some point became a follower of the way. And one of the things that we know is that when you do surrender your life completely to Jesus, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you begin to display the fruit of the Spirit. And I always challenge people that if there's things in your life that don't display the fruit of the Spirit, if there's things where we we can't really see any of the fruit of the Spirit, then it's possible that maybe we are just churchgoers and not, and not God surrenderers. That, that we've never come to a place of complete surrender where there is a transformational work that takes place in our life. That the people who maybe we once despised or the, the people that we dislike, now all of a sudden we have a love and a compassion for them. A life that once was depressed now has joy. That where anxiety used to reside, now there's peace. Where frustration and just flat out being annoyed with people comes patience. And maybe you were one who were just mean to other people and now you have kindness. Where you were harsh, you're now gentle. Where you're flighty, you're now faithful. Where your compulsions kept going, you now have self-control. These are the things that take place. These are the things that you should be known for when you've completely surrendered your life to Christ and now all of a sudden a transformational works begins to take place. It's not immediate. There's there's 
what's called sanctification. It's a process where God is working that out in you. He's instilling the, the fruit of the Spirit inside of you, and now all of a sudden, the person that you look like before surrendering to Jesus now looks very, very different. Looks a lot more like Jesus that we saw as he did his ministry. And that's exactly what happened to Dorcas. There's no account of a word that she says. We, she doesn't preach a message. She doesn't write a book. None of that. What we see is a transformational work in her actions. She began to, and this would be the second thing that, that we would see of a life of significance, she began to engage in good works. Verse 36 says that she was always doing good and helping the poor. See, once you start following Jesus, something happens on the inside of you, and now you become a different person, and you start seeing people like Jesus saw them. You no longer live for yourself, but you begin to have a heart of compassion to help others. You begin to follow in the steps of Jesus, who in chapter 10, we're going to see in verse 38, he went about doing good. We, of course, are not saved by our works. Like, we, we don't preach that here. That's, that's a whole different team. We, we are saved by God's grace in our life through our faith in him. We are not saved by our good works, but we are saved to do good works. That's a part of the plan that he has for us, is to be a people where our unique contribution to this world is to be a people that makes a difference in the lives of others. Being a follower of Jesus is not just knowing certain things. It's not just having all the right theology, all the good doctrine. It's, it's not being a certain kind of person where it's just our character that's, that's adjusted. It is about actively going around and doing good every day of our life. Matthew 5, 16, and the guys in the back don't have this, but Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and then glorify your Father in heaven. Titus 2, 7 says, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity and seriousness. 1 Timothy 6, 18 Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 1 Peter 2, 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though, may they, though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify God on the day he visits us. The world should be a better place because of us, because of his followers. God is actually interested in our daily work. It's a sacred part of our worship. Yes, it's important to gather here and worship him. It's important for us to not forsake the gathering and be equipped to live our life on mission. All of that is really important, but the mission doesn't remain in this room. It remains in the other six days of our life as we walk out those doors and we connect with those in our life circle. They should see our good deeds and glorify God because of them. Dorcas understood this. She made clothes for widows who lived in her city these were some of the neediest people in their society. They had no one to represent them, no one to protect them. They couldn't get a job or buy food, let alone buy other things that they needed. And Dorcas stepped up to become their advocate. She was a disciple who was strategically placed in the right place at the right time to minister to the needs that she had been gifted to handle. By the way, I believe... That's all of us. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in accidents. I, I don't believe that you are in this place for this time in your life. I, there's people that I, that I hear talk about, you know, kind of the decline of society and stuff and say, I wish I would have 
you know, grown up during this era of the world. I, I would have been better fit for this time. And I always push back in that, on that and say, no, God has you in this place for this time, for this season, for a specific purpose. And never think for a moment that you have no purpose in this life. You very much do. The third thing in living a life of significance that we see is that we are to rise above our limitations. We don't know a lot about this woman, Dorcas, but what we do know is that she rose above any limitations she had in order to make a difference on the lives of others. She was a woman. It was a man's world back in the first century. And although Jesus valued women and released them into ministry, and although the church valued women and released them into ministry. Dorcas didn't say, well, I'm just a woman. What can I do? She might have been single. We don't know. There's no mention of a family. We don't even know if she was a mom. She might have been, but we don't know. She could have been a widow herself. We were not sure. But it would have been a married couple's world back in the first century as well. It would have been all about family, and yet Single people like Jesus and Paul demonstrates that you don't need marriage to be complete or to be significant. Dorcas didn't say, well, uh, I need a husband before I can do anything with my life. She might have been overwhelmed by all the needs around her. Sometimes there are so many needs, and, and would we all agree that in this world that we live in right now, we look at the world and the culture that we're a part of and we think, my goodness, there are so many needs. And sometimes what can happen is the, there's so much work to be done. There's so many needs that need to be addressed that it can paralyze us and keep us from doing anything. But she didn't do that. She didn't focus on what she couldn't do. She just looked at what was in her hand. It's kind of like Moses. You remember the story of Moses where he was the guy that was called to, his purpose was to, uh, to help Israel escape from Egypt. And if you, remember, if you remember the story, Moses gave God a laundry list of reasons why he was not qualified and why he was not capable of being the guy. And isn't it interesting that that is the guy that God had planned and purposed from the very beginning, and here he is giving God a list of all the reasons why he can't do the very thing that he's called to do. And God just responds to him and says, what's in your hand? And Moses says to him, well, all I got is the staff. I got a shepherd's staff. Moses was a shepherd and he carried it around and God just tells him, lay it down and it became the staff of God. God uses what's in our hands. See, oftentimes we, we think, well, I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't, I don't, I'm not gifted enough. I'm not qualified enough. And can I just encourage you this morning that God doesn't care about what you can't do. He just cares about what you can do. And maybe God asked Dorcas, what's in your hand? She would have said, a needle. I, I can sew. I can make clothes. That, that's what I love to do. That's what I'm good at. Dorcas didn't allow any sort of limitations to hold her back, and she didn't belittle the little she had. There were many things she could not do, but what she could do she took what was in her hand and she used it to meet the needs of those around her. So maybe that's the question for all of us this morning is what's in our hand? Not what, what do we hope is in our hand or what, what do we hope to accomplish someday if we just go to church longer or we just get more information in our brains, but what is in our hand today that can make a difference in someone's life? Could we rise above our own limitations? And then we see, number four, a person of significance values faithfulness. Dorcas didn't just help one person one time. She made it a lifestyle. It says that she was always doing good and helping the poor. 
We make this a lifestyle, not a drive-by. We don't just help here and there periodically. This becomes a lifestyle for our life. And what happens is our roles and ministry involvement may change from time to time or season to season, but we faithfully live a life of service to others. We keep on keeping on. It's what we're called to do. The fifth thing in the life of a significance is that there is an endeavor to leave a legacy. When Dorcas died, she left a legacy of lives that she had touched with God's love. Think about it. She certainly was well-liked and very significant in their community. In fact, so great that they could not bear to lose her even to death. But when she became sick and she died, her good works ceased. The Joppa church was devastated and they were willing to go to any length to get her back. She was too wonderful to lose. I wonder what people would say about us. That when I die, will I be too wonderful to lose or will people be like, well, he had a good run. You know, he did the best with what he had. Or or would people be so devastated that that there was so much good that was brought, not just in pastoring Lifehouse Church, but in the community that he was a part of, and that there was so much impact, not not from a pulpit, but from in the good works? Would there be that sort of sentiment that would be said about any of us? She was too wonderful to lose, and in Acts chapter 9, verse 39 we see the continuation of the story where Peter goes with the two men that came and got him. And when he arrived, he was taken immediately upstairs to the room. All the widows that she had impacted stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. That's the question this morning, isn't it? What will we be remembered for? Will we be remembered for the good works that we've been able to accomplish? Will our community be so devastated they want us back? I think that is the question this morning. What will you be known for and what will your legacy be? Peter sent them all out of the room. He got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, and just I want to acknowledge that he calls her Tabitha. Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. I love this picture. Of course, there's just this miraculous work that's taking place. We sang about that in the song, Too Good to Not Believe, where the dead come to life, right? That that can take place even today, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There was nothing inherently powerful about Peter, but what was powerful about Peter's prayer was the boldness and the power and the faith of the Holy Spirit through Peter. He is too good to not believe that God can do the miraculous. This miracle takes place in the life of Tabitha, and I just want to point out that, to be honest, this had nothing to do with Peter, other than the faith and the obedience to go and to pray. And yes, it had something to do with Tabitha. Certainly her reputation and her life of significance was important and and she was raised to the dead uh, or raised from the dead. But I'll also remind you that she does die eventually. There was a moment in which clearly God was not finished with her in that season. But here's the beauty of when God performs miracles. 
When God does the miraculous and people's lives are healed, people's marriages are restored, that, that just were completely dead on arrival, when, when people are raised from the dead, when the miracle takes place, the purpose of the miracle is not even for the health of the individual, but it says very clearly, many people believed in the Lord. That when miracles take place, those miracles are to be shared. They're to be given and testified to so that all who hear of the miraculous work of God, that many of them will believe. And that's my prayer for our church, for the life that we're, uh, for this season that we are in the book of Acts as our faith is being built, as we're learning about the miraculous work of God through his scripture and through the Holy Spirit, that there would be many people that would experience a miracle of God, not just for their own personal benefit, but for the benefit of many who will hear and believe. We are standing, by the way, uh, right now as a church uh, with our kids director, with Liz, and we're believing for a miracle, and I know she would kill me if I made note of the fact that she's actually here with us today. Yeah. We're contending as a church family for a miracle. And there's many of you who need a miraculous work in your life. And friends, can I just remind you that, yes, we are praying for a miracle, but not just so that you would be healed or for Liz to be healed, but so that when they are, many will believe. All right. What are some of the limitations that cause you to hold back today? What are they? Maybe you're here and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. Let's start there. Let's start with a relationship with Jesus. A complete surrender. I'm not saying uh, maybe you've been coming to church for a long time or you've never come to church. I'm just saying, do you have a relationship with Almighty God through his son, Jesus Christ, and filled with the Holy Spirit? That there's been a transformational work in your life where now all of a sudden the person that you once were is completely different today. Start there in that moment. Surrender your life to Jesus. Let the Spirit of God transform your life. For other people, you might just feel a bit overwhelmed. I feel this way sometimes. We look at the world that we're a part of and, and the craziness of the world and, and just a lot of the stuff that's going on and, and it just, gosh, it feels so overwhelming and so hopeless. Like how, how could we ever even make a dent in this world? Can I just encourage you to not do nothing? <laughs> Take what's in your hand, do what you can do, and do something. Because it's part of the purpose and plan that he has for you from the very beginning of your life. Maybe we don't really believe that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. Maybe we just we, we feel insignificant this morning. Whether you're watching online, you're here in the room, you just feel a level of insignificance of like, what could I possibly do? Maybe you understand that you are to have a plan and purpose, and you may even understand what that plan is, but you feel like it's too late. You're too old. You've come to a stage in your life where you, you just, you're like, I, I can't do it anymore. And to you, I would just remind you that Dorcas continued to feed the poor, continued to make clothes for the widows until her dying breath. You are never too old. My dad's proof of this, he's, he works in our nursery. Hey, hey, hey. 
he goes and he serves in our nursery. My parents are uh, still pastoring and ministering. You, when you retire from the ministry, you don't retire from God. <laughs> you don't get to say, okay, God, I'm taking a break now. We, we continue to live this out forever until our dying breath. It's not too late to make a difference and to live a life of significance. For some other folks, it might just be strongholds in your life. There might be things from your past that you've never dealt with or addressed in your life, and it's holding you back. Maybe there's unforgiveness and bitterness that's creeped into your life, and you've never fully surrendered that to the Lord. And because of that, it's it's causing it's circumventing the significance that you can have in the world because it's it's doing so much terrible things in your life that it's ruining it maybe there's just this sense that from my past there's just so many things that I've done in my past or so many things that I just have never let go of that there's no possible way God could use me for his purpose and his plan and I would just say that's nonsense that the God I serve he breaks every stronghold well we're going to sing about it in just a few minutes that that there can be breakthrough in your life that that God wants to do something to release and bring freedom and victory in your life if you're one that's sitting there saying there is no way that God can use me. That's a lie from the enemy. God has a plan and a purpose for your life and he wants you to live a life of significance. And that may mean making clothes for widows and the poor. It may mean serving in the church, but friends, don't get caught up in the fact that what was taking place in this life of significance in Dorcas's life, it didn't just happen within the church. It happened with all those who were needy. The significant life that we get to live doesn't just remain in our ability to serve on a dream team in this building. It doesn't remain in gathering together and hearing a message about living a life of significance. It doesn't even just remain inside our homes, although very much an important part of your significant life. It happens in our life circle. It happens here as one portion of our life circle, but it also happens in our workplace. We live a life of significance where people who we work with see our good deeds and they give glory to God. It's in our neighborhoods. It's with your neighbors, the people that you are in more contact with than any of us on a Sunday morning. It's those interactions where they see your good deeds and they give glory to God. It's in your schools. It's in those places that you frequently visit all of the time. It's in your home. Parents, your life of significance begins with your children. We can live lives of significance, but those lives of significance don't remain in here. They walk out these doors, and they are significant six of the seven days. Seven of the seven days, but certainly the next six. My hope for you is if there's any limitation, anything holding you back today, that you would experience God's grace, that you would experience his favor and his provision in your life, and that as we close our time in worship, that you would confess those things that are holding you back, and that you would allow him to do a work in your life and bring freedom and victory from the strongholds that are limiting you. Let's pray.